It's early morning in South Central Los Angeles, and it's anybody's guess who will get killed tonight. Another night, another siren in South Central Los Angeles. Please, please, please! There's civilians in a war zone. The crack business was lucrative for high-powered dealers like Ricky Ross. American shooting war. The war involving thousands of youth gang members in the nation's second largest city. Black groups who call themselves Crips and wear blue colors, and Bloods who wear red. The war is escalating and spreading, fueled by quick money and big drugs. South Central Los Angeles has been depicted in Hollywood for decades. The history of South Central is rich due to the fact that as many African Americans were heading north during Jim Crow, many moved out west and settled in Southern California. California became the land of milk and honey, beautiful weather, and affordable homes for working class families. As the Civil Rights era came to an end, the Black Panther Party rose. And once Quantel Pro destroyed the movement, drugs took its place. No drug seems to be spreading faster on the streets of Los Angeles than rock cocaine. Some say it has become an epidemic because what was once the rich person's drug is now within reach of the middle class and perhaps even the poor. Tonight, investigative reporter Jim Forbes has the first part of his special report on the cocaine epidemic. Heroin, I've shot coke. I've used all sorts of other drugs. Nothing has had an effect that this has had on me. He was a hardcore drug user for 10 years, and he's talking about cocaine, rock cocaine. These small nuggets, each packing a chemical high so powerful, users say that when smoked, it's a drug unlike any other. It's like having an orgasm is, is what it's like. It's, it's, it's such a good feeling. It's such a euphoric feeling. A high so compelling that young women have been known to prostitute themselves for just three dollars, just to get money to buy a rock. Some of them don't even turn it for that. They just turn it for the rock. And a 15-minute high. A high so diluted that it eats away at the mind. I stole from my father. More or less, he's laying on his deathbed, and I was dipping into his savings and stealing thousands at a time. A high so demanding and it's sold on streets throughout South Central Los Angeles. It's eroding the fabric of a proud and building community. There is no way to build up any community with this kind of a disease in that community. This is worse than AIDS, it's worse than herpes, it's worse than all other kinds of diseases. Because it's simply tearing, it's eating away, it's a cancer of the mind. See, these people are copping right now. These people are copping dope. This cancer is being peddled in the open, where it's not at all difficult to find. And should you be naive, innocent, or untried, pushers will find you. There's another one standing over there. Look at him, patting his hand. Thank you, got nothing. But that's it. All up and down this area. Listen carefully for a moment. You'll hear a high-pitched whistle. That was a warning, a signal to peddlers that our car was suspicious. If they hadn't seen that camera, that other street, those guys would have sold you rocks right there. So we placed our camera where it wasn't seen, and for 21 continuous hours, we witnessed scores of deals, day and night. I call them stop and cop, rock houses. You can pull your car up, somebody runs out to the car, sells you rocks. Kids, often gang kids, jiggling their wares, counting their profits, over and over again. Most of that money will go into the house, where the adults stay hidden, raking in the biggest profit while remaining insulated from arrest and a long prison term. Jesse Jackson made a very good analogy. Where there is no hope, they turn to dope. Chilton Alphonse grew up in South Central L.A. He's on the mayor's gang task force and tries to mediate disputes between warring factions. Alphonse is also soliciting government and corporate money, hoping to fund alternatives to dope peddling. He says the streets today are much worse than in his day. They need guidance. And they need help. And it's time to stop talking about it, as has been done in uh, the halls of our elected officials. And... Put the money where the mouth is. How do you tell a kid who's selling dope and making $1,000 a week that that's a bad thing to do and he had to go work at Jack in the Box for four and a half an hour? In the 1980s, cocaine flooded South Central. Crack cocaine hit hard in the inner city starting in the early 80s. The drug is relatively cheap and highly addictive. It spread quickly. And one man would change the course of history forever. And he did it with the government's help. Ricky Donnell Ross, known as Freeway Rick, 
was born on January 26, 1960 in Tyler, Texas. At the age of five, Ricky and his family moved to South Central Los Angeles in hopes of a brighter future, as many African Americans did during the 50s and 60s. Opportunity was scarce due to white residents fleeing, which influenced the removal of funding for schools, programs, and other necessities for the black communities in Los Angeles. Rick grew up poor, sometimes with no food or good clothes. Shortly after their move, Rick's uncle George was murdered by Rick's mother. George had been irate and permanently removed Rick's mother's right eye. And when he had another episode, she had enough and killed him out of self-defense. As Rick got older, to distract himself from joining a gang and getting in trouble, he kept busy with high hopes for his future. After seeing some neighborhood friends come home with new track suits and fresh Adidas, they told him it was because they were ranked in tennis that they got the gear. This persuaded Rick to play tennis, and he became a star quickly in the city. Rick earned all city honors twice, as well as first team all conference accolades for each of those respective seasons. Rick attended Dorsey High School. Scholarships began coming in for Rick, but there was a problem. He was illiterate. Since Rick couldn't go to school, he started working and hustling on his own. He had an interest in cars and worked with chop shops. A friend introduced him to cocaine and told him it would be the next best thing. The friend let Ricky take $50 worth, which he ended up losing due to another friend ripping him off. One day while playing tennis with a former teacher, Mr. Fisher, Fisher asked Rick what he was up to, and Rick told him he was getting into the cocaine business. Fisher told him, I got some hookups for you. Rick was introduced to Julio Savala, a Nicaraguan who provided aid to the Contras by selling cocaine. The U.S. at the time were aiding Contras during the Reagan administration because they were at war with the Sandinistas. Savala took a liking to Rick because of his intelligence. He was also impressed with his clientele, and they started off with a few ounces. A few ounces turned into a few kilos fast. Rick moved up quickly because of his disgust to use drugs and his focus. As he elevated, he went through different plugs until he met Danilio Blandone. This changed everything. This is when he became Freeway Rick. Danilio Blandone was a formerly educated man from Nicaragua as well, with access to large amounts of cocaine. When he and Rick started off doing business, they would park across the street and signal each other when the coast was clear. After that, they found a secure location. This connection made with Blandone allowed Rick to pocket twenty to thirty thousand dollars more each day in the early stages. Cornell Ward was Rick's right hand. Cornell played football but was ineligible in college, so he stopped. After seeing Rick in passing one day, he took his $1,800 refund check and bought himself into the game. Rick working with Blandone meant more money and more weapons, which created problems down the line with gangs. Frogman dove into the San Francisco Bay and found 400 pounds of cocaine, which was the first case to tie Contras with selling narcotics. Savala was one of the men arrested due to those findings. Blandone was involved as well. Savala was handed 10 years in prison and Blandone was freed. Blandone at the time unknown to his associates was an asset for the CIA in aiding the Contras after Congress voted to stop providing aid in Nicaragua. Reagan said as long as he has breath in his body, he will help the Contras and even referred to himself as a representation. This happened on my watch. Let's start with the part that is the most controversial. A few months ago, I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. As the Tower Board reported, what began as a strategic opening to Iran deteriorated in its implementation into trading arms for hostages. This runs counter to my own beliefs, to administration policy, and to the original strategy we had in mind. There are reasons why it happened, but no excuses. It was a mistake. Rick and the Freeway Boys became millionaires overnight. Rick began making $1 million to $3 million a day, all while maintaining a low profile in L.A. In our heyday, as much as maybe a million a day, two million a day sometimes, maybe more, you know, a few days. Not this wasn't every day, though. Right. It was like it, we had days that, that. That's how much you were taking in. Right, in one day. 
Ross says he complained to his supplier, Danilo Blandon, that he had difficulty counting all the money. So eventually he bought us a money machine, you know, and he brought it over to us. And, and it, eased, it eased the pain, you know, a lot. But eventually it, it even got too much for, the, for one money machine. We had, we wound up getting three money machines to count it. Because one money machine would just be running, 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 and then we'd have money stacked. And we had people that uh, all they would do all day was count money. His diplomatic attitude allowed him to mingle and create relationships in many spaces outside of South Central. As Rick continued to grow in notoriety, the LA County Sheriff's Department opened an investigation on him. They wanted to know where he got his cocaine from. Blandon was fully invested into providing as much cocaine as Rick needed to make the crack, which at the time was Ready Rock. When Blandon was approached by an officer, his security and associate was a member of the CIA and told the officer, you're not supposed to be here. The investigation focused itself on Rick. Law enforcement created the Freeway Rick Task Force, which was put in place to catch him in the act. Rick was always 10 steps ahead, and they had no idea how he looked like. Informants were hard to find, and Rick had different aliases. Rick always switched cars, and he would ride by raids unnoticed. Rick set up many businesses to clean his money. Laundromats, car dealerships, motels, and restaurants. All in an attempt to go legit, which was his goal. One day as Rick and his folks were leaving Big Palace, police were trailing them and he noticed. One of Rick's guys, Al, saw a known officer with a rifle. Al told Rick if that officer had a good shot, he would take it. And so they went on a high speed chase. Rick jumped out the car as it was in drive and his other two guys got caught. Officers planted drugs in the trunk and they took pictures. Because of Rick's lawyer, they all got off. And that's when Rick decided to expand to other places and began with Ohio. After Rick's stint in Ohio, he decided to come back to Los Angeles in 1988 and focus on his businesses. He was out of the drug game. Rick turned his attention to his motel business. He wanted to be the king of motels. Violence in LA got out of hand by then, and since he built a good relationship with folks in the streets, he rarely had issues. It's not easy to quantify fear, although the Los Angeles Police Department makes a gallant stab at the problem. The department estimates the existence of between four and five hundred street gangs in the city of Los Angeles. Total gang mem membership, somewhere between 40 and 50,000. When the estimate is extended to encompass all of Los Angeles County, that is the more than 3,000 square mile area between Ventura and San Bernardino in Southern California, the LA police estimate rises to between 70 and 90,000 street gang members. I've seen young men die on the streets in a pool of blood. But violent drug peddling gangs are spreading out across the nation. As their numbers grow, police are cracking down. But the success of the fight against the gangs is being seriously questioned. The war on gang war, fully committed in this case to murder, rape, burglary, aggravated assault, and most particularly the sale and distribution of hard drugs. Here in South Central Los Angeles is the heart of gang territory. 22,000 known gang members spread across 58 square miles. And it is here, for the past two years, that police and the community have been waging war on gang crime. It's like hell in Los Angeles. This is the worst place in the world to live. Everybody wants to come in and live, and this is a really bad place. This what makes it so bad? The drugs and the gangs. Wasn't for the drugs and the gangs, it'd be all right. But that's, that's the problem. Gang membership is up 40% this year in Los Angeles. And South Central LA still averages one drive-by shooting every day. That's the part that bothers me. When is it ever going to stop? Where do it end at? And once they kill all these other then who's left? <laughs> Neighborhood kids say they worry about being killed all the time. Especially around here in this area, you know, we don't want to walk the streets. See, every time we watch the street, you see me looking back, I'm, you know, wondering, I have to watch who's coming or whatever. He and his friend Pookie Felix say they want to stay out of gangs. But the only safety they can find is in guns. I got a, uh, got me a, a sawed off 14, sawed off 12, got a uh, 357 and a uh, four five. So we don't have guns for drive-by. We have guns for okay. somebody ignorant who want to try something, and we just have to, you know, let loose on them. Mainly, we hate, you know, doing it to our people, but 
They asked for it, so it's got to be done. I had guns put on me numerous of times, had my money took in and my meal tickets, and I found sanctuary with the gangs in my neighborhood because the school I went to was out of my neighborhood. And then from there on, it just got more deeply involved with the murders and um, robberies and forth on. Uh, that's what um, gang banging is all about. It's um, about going back to another neighborhood, um, shooting, or just um, making it known that your neighborhood do exist. And uh, if I can't get a gun, it's people in the neighborhood that has one. So like if my gun was taken from the police, I always can get one from someone else, somewhere else within my neighborhood. and. Uh, carry on with what I was planning to do in the first place or someone else to do it for me. I have uh, fired off a gun at uh, numerous of peoples. I haven't stuck around to see if they died or not, but most likely I have. Uh, the, all the friends that I grew up with as a, as a kid, like um, coming up before I get in elementary, playing like with, um, with the G.I. Joe dolls and Legos and Hot Wheels cars, Friends I really grew up with that was from my neighborhood, all of them is dead right now. All the friends I'm hanging around with now just moved in the neighborhood or I, re I met them recently. All my friends is dead. Many gang members make it to 30? Uh, if they um, locked up in jail for the rest of their life, they probably could. Um, people that's um, not in gangs, it's like they're civilians in a war zone. So they're more terrified, just as I am, walking down the street when I know I'm out in my neighborhood. I'm about as scared as just people that's not into gangs. Because your only, only sanctuary is your neighborhood. You never think about tomorrow, it's just today. That's the way you grow up thinking in the neighborhood because you lose your value of uh, what life is really all about. So you just get your money right there and you have a lot of money. You spend it on girls, buy jewelry, fast cars, more drugs, and keep spending money when you have to. Then, you get raided, busted by the police or something, and then that's took and you have to start all over again. And uh, then you're having so much fun in the neighborhood, it's like a game, you know, it's like so much excitement, it's like going to like Magic Mountain and getting on Colossus or something. It's just fun and it's hard to get out. Once you get caught up in it, you lose yourself off in it, off in the game. I'm receiving calls from literally all over the Western United States saying we have got gangbangers from your city and our city and they're selling cocaine like it's going out of style. Police say the drugs and violence are being spread to other cities chiefly by two long-standing rivals in the Los Angeles youth gang scene. Black groups who call themselves Crips and wear blue colors and Bloods who wear red. Youth gangs, primarily black and Hispanic, are setting records this year. More than 160 gang-related killings in the Los Angeles area alone. People dying over nothing, man. You join the gang today, you're looking at the two possibilities of going to the graveyard or the penitentiary. A man who was standing in line to see colors, the movie about gangs was shot in the head by someone wearing the colors of a rival gang. So far this year, almost 100 people have been killed in gang-related violence in the Los Angeles area. And for every death, as Bonnie Strauss reports, there are related victims. But gang members are not the only victims of gang violence. DeAndre was a quiet and loving boy who loved everybody. He would be missed. He was just nine years old, killed in a crossfire while playing with friends in a park. My boyfriend just got killed two and a half weeks ago by gang members. And my friend, she was killed. She was 14. She got her head blew off. They don't care about no girl. A girl life is meaningless, just like a man. That's all you're looking for is most respect. Like if you go to jail, you do, they say, well, he bad, so you give him his respect. If I can take over another neighborhood by myself, I feel I'm the baddest one around. Gang violence killed nearly 400 people here last year. Police say it's the love of drugs and money that keeps the death toll high and climbing. More than half of those killed were innocent victims, people just caught in the crossfire. They might take my life before I take theirs. Is that any way to live? No, there's no way to live, but they ain't got no other choice. A vicious cycle of violence and vengeance tearing through Los Angeles at a rate of a death a day. There are gangs of all kinds, Hispanic gangs, a growing number of Asian gangs, but today most of the killers and victims are Guys think black. they're warriors out here. Much like soldiers or warriors, they'll protect their territories. 
Why are you guys bloods? Why are you in the gangs? Why is we in the gang? I guess because the area we grow up in, man. Everybody go in that area, man. Dusty is a gang banger, which is what they call you when you've been allowed in as a full-time active gang member. What, what is that? OG's, BG's. OG's is our original gangster. Like me. Original gangster. <laughs> and BG's? BG's is baby gangsters. <laughs> baby gangsters. Baby yeah. gangsters. Call us BG. Now you're, you're proud of the fact that you're you're From in the Lime gang. Hood. Yeah. Lime Hood. But you're, you're proud of the fact that you're blood. Yeah. Why is that? Why? Yeah. Because I'm down. I'm down for it. Because I'm a true. I'm a true. I come from the heart. But why? Why is why being a gang? What's in it for you? What's in it? I mean, you get killed, right? Yeah. Well, you mean some of your friends been killed? Yeah. So for a simple cause. What's, so, what, what, what's the simple cause? Of being a blood, going down with the blood. That's how we feel. We die. It's like we go kill one of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of them died, cause they down for it. They get took out. And then guess what happens after one of them die? And they come back. And then it's right. a few until they don't want no more, until everybody just drop it. But ain't nobody gonna drop it. Now you, you're, willing to, you're willing to die for whatever this cause is? If that's what it takes. Yeah, I'm not saying you want to, I'm saying no, you will. No, I don't want to. But if, if somebody riled up on me and take me out, I guess it was my time to go like that. How, but ain't how, nobody did it yet, so I guess it ain't my time to go. How old are you? I'm 17. I don't wanna be a star in football player. That's what I want to do. Dr. Jekyll, say hello to Mr. Hyde. Yeah, this Paru, that's enough, love. That's protecting your homeboys. Watching out for one another. Something y'all don't do, y'all don't watch out for. You wouldn't die for him, would you? You saying that now on TV, him. but you wouldn't die for him for real. Die for I'd die for my homeboy. Would you die? Yeah, I'd die for my homeboy. Rick also helped many artists in the area get started in their music careers, even funding one of Anita Baker's albums. After a series of unlawful arrests, Rick decided to testify against the officers for their exploits and in change for lesser time. Officers beat on him and let the dogs harm him as well during one of the arrests. After doing a brief stint behind bars, Rick got out and gave the legit route another shot. Rick was soon set up by Blandon, who by this point he looked at as somewhat of a father figure. As law enforcement came down on Rick, Blandon was present with them, and he smiled as Rick got arrested. Rick took his case to trial, and he was hit with a life sentence. Facing life in prison, LA's biggest crack dealer now is saying he was a pawn in a CIA plot, and his argument was convincing enough that a federal judge postponed sentencing to consider evidence that his main supplier was an agency operative. You know, his whole intentions was for me to make more money. The more money I made, the more money he made, and I guess the more money that uh, he would have to help sponsor the war. Gary Webb, an investigative reporter who at the time worked for Mercury News, looked into Rick's story and aided in exposing the CIA's involvement and in bringing cocaine into the U.S. Did the CIA put drugs into black community? We don't have any evidence so far that they did it directly. And what we have evidence of is that men working for a CIA-run army did do that. With the knowledge of the CIA? That's the part we don't know. That's the part we don't know. I mean, what we know is that these guys were working for a CIA army. They were meeting with CIA agents before and during the time they were doing this. What happens from there is sort of where we ran into the wall of uh, national security. I'm a former Los Angeles police narcotics detective, and I work South Central Los Angeles, and I will tell you, Director Deutsch, that the agency has dealt drugs throughout this country for a long time. About charges that the CIA introduced crack cocaine into South Central Los Angeles in the mid-1980s. It is an appalling charge. It is an appalling charge that goes to the heart of this country. It is a charge that cannot go unanswered. Deutsch How pledged a thorough investigation. His extraordinary public relations mission to Watts came in response to a public outcry over a report by a California paper, the San Jose Mercury News. The three-part series, Dark Alliance, appeared in August on the internet as well as in print. Although the articles drew criticism by several major newspapers, they raised a firestorm of outrage and prompted official inquiries. 
The newspaper asserted that members of the CIA's army in Nicaragua helped spark a crack cocaine explosion in urban America in the 1980s. The report said two Nicaraguans, Danilo Blandon and Norwin Manessis, sold tons of cocaine to Los Angeles drug dealer Ricky Ross. The article said Blandon and Manessis funneled millions of dollars in profits to CIA-backed rebels fighting the leftist Sandinista government in Nicaragua. The article showed no direct link to the CIA, but did include a photograph of Manessis on the right with Adolfo Calero in the center, a leader in the CIA-funded rebel army known as the Contras. Even without hard evidence connecting the CIA with drug dealing, many have accepted that conclusion. A standing room only crowd of about 1,500 attended a forum on the subject in September. LA Congresswoman Maxine Waters was one of the organizers. Now there are people who will say, well, Ms. Waters, maybe the CIA wasn't directly involved. Maybe it was just the people from Nicaragua and other places who were kind of CIA connected. Maybe they just turned their heads. Maybe they just kind of blinked and said, well, it doesn't make any difference whether they delivered the kilo themselves or they turned their heads while somebody else delivered it, they're just as guilty. We're here today to put a face on our outrage and our disappointment in what we know is a government ploy and a setup to decimate our community. The answer you get to the questions you ask depends totally on how you frame the question. If you ask the question, did the CIA sell drugs in the black neighborhoods of Los Angeles to finance the Contra War, the answer will be a categorical no. Now having said that, we have to go back to what is true. And what is true is the policymakers absolutely closed their eyes to the criminal behavior of our allies and supporters in that war. The policymakers ignored their drug dealing, their stealing, and their human rights violations. That there has been a connection made between the government, the CIA, and its involvement in drug trafficking to support the country. CIA knowingly and intentionally did what amount to pump crack cocaine into Los Angeles to help fund rebels in Nicaragua. Whether or not these claims prove true, the anger they produced is very real. So when L.A.'s black citizens heard of the San Jose Mercury News reports claiming CIA-backed Contras opened the first pipeline for Colombian cocaine to their communities, their first reaction, shock. Their second, anger. You want to know why black people don't believe in the government? Because we know what the government is capable of. My God, my God. What's next? Someone in Washington made a decision that they were going to deal in drugs or ignore the Contras dealing in drugs, which basically assisting them because it was too important to defeat the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. The CIA knows about everything that happens in the world. For that amount of uh, illicit substance to enter this community, nobody here believes that, that, that uh, the authorities should know about it. We, they had to know. Former CIA pilot Robert Plumley admits he was among those who flew the clandestine missions to supply weapons to the Nicaraguan Contras and among the pilots ordered to fly drugs back to the U.S. Orders, Plumley says, came not from CIA headquarters, but from individuals acting on their own. Former drug enforcement agent said that from 1986 until he retired in 1992, he documented evidence that the CIA participated in cocaine distribution to Los Angeles gangs. The CIA and the DEA knew that the Contra pilots were involved in narcotics trafficking we are not the problem. The problem is, how do the drugs get in the community from the start? Gary would lose his job and fall into a deep depression in which it was said he committed suicide by means of two shots to the head. Rick learned how to read in prison and found loopholes in his case against the government. Rick was able to get his life sentence cut down to 20 years and is now a free man who mentors and owns businesses. Hit the subscribe button and follow my social media accounts on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for watching.